Hello once again and welcome to this session, this series on lessons from the Bible. And we are studying the book of Revelation. We have completed chapter 1 of the book of Revelation and today we are going to begin chapter 2. And primarily we will be looking at the letter to the church at Ephesus. And so without any delay, let's get into this and try to, to delve into some deeper things in this book. The, from, chap, from the session we did before, one of the things we had said was the book of Revelation is really a, the climax of God's covenant with Abraham, which he made in Genesis chapter 12. And it is the Revelation shows us how that, that covenant reaches its climax and how God restores his original intent. So Revelation is really a book that is going back to the beginning. Uh, where everything started, Revelation is going to end there. So we had, we had explained that in the beginning, in our first session. But now, as we go into the book of Revelation, we want to delve into some more details of the book, a little more specifically. And one of the things, one of the ways we could look at this book, th th this book is, you know, it is it's so, it is deep. There's so many different things taking place in the book of Revelation, all at the same time. But one of the key things we could look at is how Jesus transitions from different roles or different functions throughout the book. And when we, we, we note those transitions and how he functions, it, it helps us to understand the flow of the book of Revelation. In other words, Revelation has a structure, it has an order. And one of the ways we could understand that order is when we understand how Jesus functions in the book. Once we understand his different uh, roles, his different functions, it gives us an understanding of the flow in the book. And it helps us to understand the book itself and what it says. So, for example, in chapters 1 to 3 of the book of Revelation, Jesus appears as the high priest of the church. And he is speaking to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. And he is cleansing the churches by his word, the, the word that comes from his mouth. And so he's high priest in chapters 1, 2, and 3. But when we go to chapters 4 and 5, Jesus appears as the kinsman redeemer, as a lamb that was slain. And that phrase, kinsman redeemer, from the book of Ruth, where Boaz was able to buy back the possessions uh, that Ruth and Naomi had lost, and therefore he redeemed their possessions. Jesus is a kinsman redeemer. We see him like that in chapters 4 and 5, so we will study that some more. And there's a transition. He moves from high priest to kinsman redeemer. There's a transition, and we'll talk about that. Then in chapters 6 to 18, Jesus functions as judge, where he judges the nation and he judges the sins and the wickedness of men. So there's a transition from kinsman redeemer for the church and for, the, for, for mankind to judge. Then in chapter 19, we see Jesus as the bridegroom of the church, but as the Messiah for Israel. He, he returns to fight for Israel on the earth. It's very interesting. So there's a transition there as well. And then in chapter 20, we see Jesus functioning as king, in the millennial kingdom. He's ruling as king of all the youth from Israel. And in chapters 21 to 22, we see him as the eternal God, who he always is. The eternal God ruling over mankind. So, so there are transitions in the way Jesus functions in the book of Revelation. And these transitions really indicate the different changes in the book and the different um, time periods we enter into. That's interesting, and we will look at those more when we get into those chapters. But for now, since we're in chapters 2 and 3, we're going to delve here, try to get into this in some more details. So in, in these chapters, Jesus, who appeared to John in a vision, he gave John messages to seven churches. These churches were present. They were real, literal churches that were present in John's day in a place called Asia Minor, which is today roughly called Turkey. And there were seven real churches. The number seven in the scriptures generally refers to completeness, wholeness, 
perfection. You know, God created heaven and earth and he rested on his seventh day after he had finished or completed everything. So seven usually refers to completion. And these messages that Jesus gave to these seven churches was really messages to all the churches of all time, right up to the time when the church would be raptured. So in other words, he wasn't giving messages to each church alone. The message to each church was really a message for all the churches of all times. And if we see in chapter 2 verse 7, uh, verse 11, chapter 2 verse 17 and so on, there's a phrase that's constantly repeated that happened here. Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, plural. So the messages is not just for those individual churches, it's for us today. And that's why studying these things would benefit us. Some people believe that each of these churches represents a period in the history of the church. And so each church from Ephesus all the way to Laodicea represents different years in the history of the church from the time Jesus was resurrected until the time that he would return. And that may be so, but there's not, to me, there's not enough um, evidence to support that because you cannot easily distinguish when one period of one church ends and when the next period began in church history. But some people hold to that view. In any way you look at it, the message to each church is a message to all the churches and therefore it is necessary to pay attention to them. And Jesus is cleansing the church by his word. In chapter 1 verse 16, John says he saw a sword coming out of his mouth. That sword is really his word coming out of his mouth. So we have John getting these messages from Jesus and the messages that Jesus gives to John follows a, a rough outline. We could broadly categorize each of the, 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 the points Jesus gives to all the churches. First of all, he, he begins with a description of himself. Some in chapter 1, John described Jesus in different ways. Each letter begins with a description of Jesus taken from chapter 1. And then after, Jesus commends the church for something or things that they did well. Then he rebuked the church for things that they did not do well. Then he gave them counsel on what they should do so that they could get their, you know, their lives and get the church back on, on target. Back to where it should be. And then he gives a promise to the overcomer. To those who listen to what he says and does it. There's a promise to them. And he ends every letter by saying, Let him that has an ear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. This is something Jesus says at the end of every letter. And so that's the overall summary, overall outline of what he says. But today we're looking at Ephesus specifically. This is verse 1 all the way to verse 7 of Revelation chapter 2. And overall, generally, Jesus, his, his message to the church at Ephesus was that he requires intimacy. Jesus wants intimacy more than anything else is his priority he wants relationship that was the message to the church at ephesus and so let's delve into it to see where what he said that tells us intimacy is what he wants he begins in verse one by talking about he is the one who holds the seven stars in his hand in his right hand and he also walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Right hand is a symbol of power. You know, it's a symbol of strength and authority. And the stars from chapter one is a symbol of the, the leaders or the pastors of those churches. So when he says that he holds the seven stars in his hand, he is saying that he is holding the leader or the pastor of this church in his right hand. He has the power and the authority 
which respected the leader. He could strengthen the leader, the pastor. He could um, motivate the pastor, or he could remove him because he is the authority, Jesus. And then he also says that he walked in the midst of the candlesticks. The candlesticks represent the churches, in this case, Ephesus. And so Jesus was present in the church, which means that he was ready to act. He was ready to do what was necessary. So he was ready to act with respect to the leader and he was ready to act with respect to the church members. Jesus was present. And that's what he meant by holding the seven stars and, and, and walking in the midst of the candlesticks. He told them, I know your works. I know your labor and your patience and you cannot bear them which are evil. And so he started to commend them. When he says, I know your labor, the word labor means a wearisome effort. In other words, they were very um, focused on doing what he required of them. They weren't playing games. They were working and they were working consistently. Then he told them, I know your patience. <clears throat> Excuse the word patience means to bear up. And it means things might be difficult, but you ain't giving up. Still do what you know you're supposed to do. He says, you try, you, you cannot bear them which are evil. That means people who are worthless. That's what the word evil there means. As the mother fact, he said, you try them who are apostles and you found that they were liars. This, this church was serious about standards. They were serious about holiness. They were serious about righteousness. They were serious about godly leaders. And so they were very, very focused on making sure that the purity of the church was maintained. Paul was one of the persons who worked in Ephesus. John himself, the author of this book, worked in Ephesus. Timothy worked in Ephesus for some time. And these leaders worked, you know, arduously in building the church. When Before Paul left Ephesus, he warned the leaders that Evil men will come <clears throat> and will try to corrupt the church, excuse. And they took that warning carefully. That's why they tested leaders. You read the book of Acts and you'll see. Just before Paul left, he warned them. And they took his warning carefully. So they, they tested those who said that they were apostles and they, have, and they found them to be liars. In verse 3, Jesus says, you have borne and you have patience. For my, my name's sake, you have labored and you have not fainted. When he says you have borne, borne means you have endured. You continue to be uh, persistent. And he says you didn't faint, you didn't become weary. And then in verse 6, he told them, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a group of people who were apparently bringing division in the church. Apparently one of the things they were doing is making a difference between the leaders and the members and it kind of segregated the church in putting the leaders as a, a high class of people and the members as just normal that wasn't right it was not a good way to divide the church because the church was one jesus says i hate that but also the nicolaitans apparently was a group of people who were preaching that because of grace the church could commit sexual sins and do that with the, 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 the people around in the society. But grace will cover that. And Jesus says that he hates that. The leaders, the church at Ephesus, hated that teaching as well. They hated this group of, this, this practice of sexual immorality. And that was what Jesus commended them about. But even in the midst of all of that, there was one thing that's very, very very, very important what Jesus focused on. He says, you have left your first love, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Which is very interesting. The word first in this verse, verse 4, does not mean first in order or number, like 1, 2, 3, 4. First means in terms of rank or importance. So what Jesus was saying to them was, 
your love is not focused on what is really the most important thing. You have love, but your love is not focused on the most important thing. And that is what Jesus was, 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 what he rebuked them about. They were passionate. They were committed as a church. But the love, which is the thing that distinguishes us as believers. Remember Jesus said they will know them because of your love for one another. That was missing in the church. As a matter of fact, Jesus says your priority is mixed up. Remember Jesus when they asked Jesus, what is the greatest command? He answered by telling them, the greatest command in Mark chapter 12. When they asked Jesus, what was the greatest command? Jesus, um, he answered by saying to them, the first of all the command is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and might. In other words, that was the priority. And the church at Ephesus failed at that. Not only that, but Jesus told them, the second command is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what was going on in the church at Ephesus was, they were focused on structure. They were focused on order. They were focused on making sure that there's a purity of the church maintained. You know, they were focused on doing what, what, what they were supposed to be doing as a church. But they, they missed the most important thing, which was loving Christ and having an intimate relationship with Him. And also having love, intimate relationship with, the, with the, their brothers and sisters between themselves. And Jesus says, that's not right. As a matter of fact, He rebuked the church for that. He told them, that they need to repent because of this. So when he says you have left your first love, what Jesus was saying there is, you have left intimacy with me and you have left intimacy with your fellow brothers and sisters. You have given up relationship to focus on works. And that is the wrong priority, Jesus says. Work is not the most important thing. Relationship, an intimate relationship with him and with each other is the priority. That is what he was saying to them. So he counseled them. He said to them, remember from where you have fallen, verse five, and repent and do the first works. So when, if we realize that we have left relationship, we, have abandoned relationship or that's no longer the priority that we have. If we realize that we really do not have that close walk with the Lord anymore. First, first love means that we no longer have that priority to spend time in the Word, reading the Word. We don't have the priority to spend time in prayer. First love means when we check ourselves, we realize we are not passionate about the presence of God anymore. We're probably passionate about doing things in the church or getting our ministry to grow, our business to grow, our jobs and career to excel. But when we check, we realize we're not passionate about our closeness and intimacy with Christ. That is what He wants. And when He says you have left your first love, it means when we check ourselves, we realize we don't have that passion again. We realize we don't have the passion for each other. There's not that love for the other uh, brothers and sisters in the church. We are not um, rushing to take care of the others, more focused on ourselves. These are signs and symptoms that we have left our first love. When the focus is no more relationship, the priority is no more relationship with Christ and the, and the brethren in the church. But the priority now is probably ourselves and what we need to do. Jesus says, that is not right. And he rebuked the church. What, was, what is the solution? What is the, the way we could get out of that cycle? Jesus tells them in verse 5. He says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember. In other words, think back. 
think back how it was. Jesus was saying, take some time and think back how your life used to be. Think back where your priorities were. And look at where you are now. Remember where you were. Remember how you were passionate about serving the Lord, about getting up and, and spending time in the world. You were passionate about um, talking to Him in prayer. Passionate about spending time with Him in the house of the Lord. But then, you don't have that zeal anymore. You don't have that desire anymore. Well, remember how you were passionate about helping the brethren, spending time with other believers, enjoying the company of other believers, but now spending more time with sinners. Or you're spending more time on the television, on the internet, on YouTube, on social media, or streaming movies online. But you don't really desire to spend time with the, 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 the other saints. Remember, he says, where you were and what you used to do. And then he says, repent. In other words, acknowledge that you're not doing it correct anymore. Change your mind and focus on getting back to where you need to be. And do the first works. If I left my first love, how do I get back there? Jesus says, do the first things. And remember, first means priority. In other words, he is saying, begin to prioritize your life once again. The things you know, which is relationship. Relationship is the priority. So do the first works means begin to prioritize what you are doing once again. Just like in the beginning, your priority was spending time with Christ in the Word, studying it, and praying, and even in fasting. Your priority was going to the house of the Lord, enjoying time with other believers. Get back doing the same thing. In other words, whatever you realize was your joy and the priority you had at the beginning, you get back to that. Whatever you realize is the priority, the things you need to do as priority to get your relationship with the Lord back to where it was, to get your relationship with other people back to where it should be, then begin doing those things again. Set them as your priority and do them once again. That's what he was saying. He said, so you need to do your first works because if you don't do the first works, he says, I will come if you don't repent. I don't get back to doing priority, prioritizing your life and, and making sure that you are now focused on relationship. He says, I will come quickly and I will remove you. The word quickly there is very interesting. Quickly doesn't mean I will come, you know, from now, it will be quick before you blink, I reach. That's not what quickly means. Quickly means from the time I start till the time I finish, it will be quick. In other words, Jesus wasn't saying to them that he will come immediately and remove them. He will give them grace. He will give them time to repent. But if they don't repent, he will start to judge. And the time from when he starts judging until the end of his judgment and removing him will be quick. That's what that word quick means there. He says, I will remove you. Remove your candlesticks. In other words, the church will have no more influence. He will remove the church. He didn't say he will remove the individuals. He says he will remove the church, which is very interesting, very important. He says, I will move the church out of its place. That church will no longer have its position, its influence. It will no longer have its successes. It will become dead. And the reason is because the focus of any church should never be programs. <clears throat> it should never be activities. It should never be even doing the things that that ministry is about. That should never be the priority. The priority should be relationship with the Lord first and then with each other. That should be the priority. And he says, if you don't do that, if you don't get that right, I'll move you out. And he goes on, which is what he says to all the other churches. In verse 7, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. It's a message that he gives to to. All the churches, everybody needs to listen. So what we need to listen to this. Do not mix up the priorities. 
the, the, the focus is relationship with the Lord. He says to him that overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life. Remember in the garden in Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, the tree of life was there. And Adam and Eve could have eaten from it. Once again, God is offering that to them, which is a symbol of relationship. So he's often saying, if you focus on relationship, if you prioritize relationship with me, I will give you access once again to the tree of life, which is my divine presence, which is life or immortality. Basically, it talks about relationship with me once again. What he's saying is, what Adam lost, you will now regain. You will get it. But the reason why you will get it is not because you're working for it. It's because you have relationship as your focus. So as you were saying, the tree of life. And then he says, the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The word paradise there means garden. It's just like in Genesis, there was a tree of life in the garden of Eden. This is a reference all the way back to that. Jesus was saying to this church, what Adam and Eve lost, I will give it to you. But I will only give it to you if you focus on the right thing, which is relationship. It is not works. It is not um, how much we do or what we do. It is relationship. This is what he was telling them. So I will give you access to the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, uh, the, 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 the garden of God. That is yours. So the message that Jesus was given to the church at Ephesus is a very... Um, very clear message that intimacy is the priority relationship is the priority and if a church its leaders and the church doesn't focus on relationship with the Lord first if the church is organized and structured where it's, it's, it's focused on doing and it is a lot of teaching there's a lot of preaching there's a lot of um, social outreach program there's a lot of different things which are good things but there's little or no intimacy with the lord there's no um, spending time in that quiet moment with the lord you know the the members of the church don't have that 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 um, desire that passion about his presence when it comes to prayer prayer in the church is weak because the people in church really value the presence of god when it comes to worship, worship is just music, but it's not really heartbeat of the people going out and expressing themselves to God. It's just music, it's just song. That church, the, the relationship with the Lord is not the focus. And even move out that church. And it's not only relationship with Him, but it's the relationship with each other. When the church is more quick to correct sin, but then it is not quick to go after the sinner and the, the believer that fell and to try to build relationship with them and work with them when the focus is more correcting the sin rather than helping the sinner if they can see it who fell to be restored that means relationship is not the priority and then that is the kind of truth that jesus says that's not the right thing you should be focused on restoring the person in relationship as yes, was necessary and so this is what he he uh, he says and the message we could get from that was the, the overall lesson the life lesson we could get from from that for us is relationship is more important to god than performance relationship is more important than performance no matter how much we do the priority of god what he values is relationship. So this is what the letter to the, to, to the church at Ephesus really tells us. God's focus is relationship. And so, so this concludes the, the, this study. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to verse 7. The letter to the church at Ephesus. The priority for a church and for us as individuals is relationship relationship i hope that this was beneficial uh, i invite you 
to comment on this if you're looking at this on youtube comment uh, let me know what your thoughts are if you disagree on certain things um, just you know let me get your comments and so on whatever whatever platform you're looking at this i really invite your comments and the next session we'll be looking at the next letter which is the letter to the church at smyrna and so i invite you to join with me as we look at that but for now um, thank you for joining me and i pray that this be a blessing for you take care and god bless